Um, and early on, I had an, inc inclining, an incline towards um, gastroenterology. I, I really liked the anatomy, the pathophysiology, the, the science made sense to me. It was very um, black and white to me. It, it wasn't like a gray zone, like a lot of other fields have some unknowns. Um, and that um, inclination solidified during my clinical training, uh, which is part of the clerkships. So in your uh, third and fourth year of medical school, um, you actually do clerkships in all the major specialties. So you'll have three month blocks of, you know, internal medicine, then three month blocks of general surgery, pediatrics, OBGYN, et cetera. You may, you may not get all blocks in some specialized fields like you may not necessarily see ENT or ophthalmology, which are like the subspecialties of surgery. During your clerkship, you may get assigned. So um, I, I was assigned ophthalmology and ENT, which I liked as well. But when I did internal medicine, I really liked the GI aspect as well. So I was definitely leaning towards internal medicine early on during medical school and um, also GI. Um, so actually, let me let me start from the beginning. So um, when whenever you decide to um, pursue medicine, you know, the first step is the pre-med part. And so um, a lot of undergrad, you don't have to specialize in like biology or, you know, chemistry, organic chemistry or physics. You can you can specialize and major in any field as long as you meet the pre-med requirements. Um, and I would say a lot of my colleagues actually majored in something very random like arts or, you know, social sciences, but they get all their pre-med requirements and that helped their GPA because they weren't just focused on like a big um, pre-med um, curriculum. So, um, and then once you do your MCATs, usually they say the MCATs and then your GPA is what kind of determines, um, you know, your chances of getting into medical school. Um, it's always good to do some shadowing. So early on during um, my pre-med years, I actually um, shadowed a lot of different physicians. I did, um, I didn't do research in my pre-med years, but I did, um, you know, do a lot of volunteer work in the clinics and hospitals. A lot of people are scribes in the ER, um, which also helps their medical school application. Um, and uh, yeah, so then in medical school, I actually did do a lot of research. Um, and as I was telling you, my inclination towards gastroenterology started in my second year of medical school. Um, by the time I did my uh, clinical clerkships in my third and fourth year, a lot of them were in New York City, part of um, Cornell, Wild Cornell Medical College. And I actually ended up doing a, uh, I submitted an abstract to one of the GI societies called ACG or American College of Gastroenterology and it got accepted and I actually attended a conference in my fourth year of medical school in San Antonio, which was the ACG um, at the time, the location for the conference. Um, and I got to present a poster, which really helped um, also my chances of getting into a good residency program. Um, so, you know, I can try to share those later with you. Um, some, you know, I can show you like the poster that I made or some research. And I also did clinical, I mean, sorry, bench research in my second year of medical school as part of a summer program. So I actually spent two months in a pharmacology lab at the, um, uh, the Cancer Institute part of Cornell in New York. Um, and I did some basic, basic science research, you know, Western blots, Eastern blots, titrating stuff, pi pipetting. Um, I didn't get a publication out of it, but I uh, got to present my findings at a couple of, um, you know, grand rounds and conferences at my own medical school, as well as at the research lab. They have their conference, uh, the pathology department, the pharmacology department has a conference. So that was my first introduction to research was my bench research in second year. Then I did some clinical research, um, you know, at my medical school. And the last thing that I did was um, that little abstract that I submitted and presented it in my fourth year. So by fourth, by third year, you have to decide on a specialty. 
to apply towards residency and start working on obtaining your letters of recommendation. Um, you ideally want to get letters from attendings in that field to really help um, build your profile. So, and one of the letters is going to be from the dean of your medical school, and they kind of summarize all of your achievements, your GPA. Um, I was also part of the pre-med and medical school admission committee in my fourth year, which was also a good leadership role for me. Um, and then once I decided on gastroenterology, I started my interview process, which was in the, the fall of uh, fourth year. So the first part, first half of fourth year, because you match in March and you start your training in July. So medical school typically will end by like April, May, you have about two months to, one or two months to kind of settle down and figure out, you know, where you're moving to, get all your ducks in a row. So found out in March where I matched and um, the way I ranked my programs is I interviewed at, uh, I think seven or eight internal medicine programs and I ranked them based on their uh, expertise in GI. So. I wasn't looking at short-term goals of just internal medicine. I was looking at, does that hospital have a gastroenterology fellowship? Because the best chance you have of matching into a fellowship is at your home school or at your home program, which is your residency program, if you're interested in a subspecialty. Um, so after I, uh, you know, I, I did my rank list, I interviewed a total of seven or eight places. Um, I did get an offer for a pre-match, which is basically someone saying, hey, you know, come to our program, we guarantee you a spot, but you can't participate in the actual match, which is kind of like a gambling number. Um, and if anybody has a question on how the match works, I can kind of walk through that, but just look, let us know in the questions. Um, so I ranked my programs based on how good their GI program was. And I ended up in my number two choice, which was uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. So I went to VCU in Richmond, Virginia for my internal medicine residency, which is a three-year residency. Part of those three years, you get well-versed with all the different subspecialties, um, including you rotate in the cardiac ICU, the medicine ICU, um, you rotate through uh, some specialized wards such as hematology oncology has usually their own wards you obviously have the general medicine wards um you do some night shifts as well um you do um you know you get specialized in pulmonology and gi which are like the major fields you may not get exposed to something small like endocrinology or rheumatology and for that you have to request elective you have elective time built into your residency and you can pick which one um which subject you would like to choose. Um, and so I, I already knew I was interested in GI or even from medical school onwards. So right from the beginning, once I started residency, I started working my way towards making connections with the GI department, getting to know the attendings, especially on the GI services. When I was on, I made sure I was on top of my game. I, you know, and um, I try to shadow them whenever I had free time, go watch some procedures get to know the faculty, get to know the fellows and see what their lifestyle was and how um, their day-to-day, -day, you know, work-life balances. Um, you start applying for a fellowship in your second year of residency. Um, and so I started working on research in GI early on in my intern year. Um, I was able to do some clinical research and get two or three publications um, out of it. And uh, then when I, um, you know, then I applied for GI fellowship and the match for that is in December and you finish residency. It's always June 30th and July 1st is a new year. That's the academic year is from July 1st to June 30th. So in my third year, December is when I found out where I was going and I was lucky to have been selected at VCU itself. Um, and I stayed on for an, an additional three years and did my fellowship in gastroenterology. Um, during my fellowship, I had uh, a lot of experiences again with you know all the different subspecialties within GI. 
Um, there's obviously endoscopy, which is uh, our bread and butter procedure. But within endoscopy, they have a lot of specialized procedures. Like you could do an upper endoscopy and then also do something called radio frequency ablation or cryotherapy to kill some of the precancer cells. You know, we, we do biopsies and um, polyp remove polyps, that's standard. But then you can also deploy a pH capsule in your food pipe for me measuring acid. Um, same thing with the colonoscopy. You can do a colonoscopy for screening for removing polyps, but then within the colonoscopy, you can do a much, a lot of specialized things. You can put a stent in the colon. You can do hemorrhoid banding while you're doing your colonoscopy. Um, you do something called EMR, which is endoscopic mucosal resection, where you remove large polyps. So every field of medicine has multiple subspecialties and you can keep narrowing your focus further further down. And so um, I chose esophagus as my specialty, or not my specialty, I should say as my focus or special interest. Um, so once I graduated from fellowship after three years, I moved to Washington, D.C. because my husband is in D.C. and his family is from Northern Virginia. He was finishing up his um, dental stuff, dental school at the time. And um, you know, it was, uh, so I found, I got a position at MedStar Washington Hospital Center and I uh, do general GI, but I also do a lot of the esophageal procedures. Like I do the pH studies, which are motility, like manometry, 24 hour pH. And then we also do the wireless pH capsule in the, endos in the esophagus. Um, so I've been here for about over three years and, um, you know, I really like it. Uh, I love going to work every day. It makes me happy. Um, there are always obviously aspects of medicine that you don't like, such as the pressure for documentation. It kind of takes away from the taking care of the patient sometimes, but you have to document thoroughly about what you did. So sometimes that can take more time. There's a lot of paperwork involved, but um, at the end of the day, you are helping people, you're saving lives. Um, so that's what matters at the end. Um, any questions so far about what I talked about and any part that you would like me to focus on? If you guys have any questions, just go ahead and post them in the chat and we can read them out loud. So one thing I will add is, um, you know, I guess uh, if I can get an idea of which stages you guys are in your um in your lives like are you in undergrad are you in medical school if i can get a sense of who my audience is so if you guys want to just tell shout out in the chat and tell me what stage you're in so that i can kind of cater okay i see a lot of undergrad some residency okay so um when i was in high school I knew I, I also knew I wanted to do medicine early on because of my grandma always says, oh, mom's going to be a doctor. Like it was like a given thing. So, um, you know, and I was very involved in her medical care. I, um, I, uh, she had diabetes. I actually helped her with her insulin shots. And I would also take her to her appointment sometimes when I, she was in India, but I would go there and do that. Um, and so that was one of that was what I used in my personal statement about why I went into medicine. So that was a part of my personal statement for pre-med and then for um, medical school. Uh, my personal statement was focused on, um, again, my volunteer work and my shadowing experience, as well as I did touch upon why I became uh, went into medicine in the first place. So, you know, getting into pre-med did the SATs, um, there's not much you can do except for your personal statement is what really, um, you know, impacts your undergrad experience, but, and your SAT scores. And then during undergrad, when you're doing your pre-med courses, um, you obviously want to have really high scores and a good GPA in your pre-med, the core pre-med requirements, which are, I think, physics, um, general chemistry, you know, um, organic chemistry, biology, 
and they say organic chemistry is what makes or breaks a man, which is absolutely true. There's a lot of orgo on your MCATs. There's a lot of orgo, you know, if your GPA is high in orgo, that actually reflects really well on you. For some reason, the way organic chemistry is, you know, you think about it, it correlates with being a good doctor, I guess, because it, it's very critical thinking. You know, you have to really understand what you're doing when you solve uh, a problem in orgo. Um, there's also calculus and writing, but that's kind of, you know, not a big deal. And also for your MCATs, a lot of programs may not look at your, they, they look at your total score, but they also look at the breakdown and see um, what was your specific scores in the sciences and the math um, and, um, you know, or I would say orgo physics, et cetera, and not necessarily look at the reading, let's say if English is not your first language. Um, so, you know, during pre-med, my focus was to have a good GPA and get a good MCAT score. Um, you can take the MCAT multiple times. I took it twice. Um, I would say, don't be afraid of taking it twice. You have to submit one score at the end. So make sure you have a MCAT score is, is, is an objective way for the programs to look at how, um, I guess, good you are at test taking plus your knowledge base. Um, so definitely work on your GPA in the pre-med requirements. And if you have a major in something that's not hard, that's good because your overall GPA will also be higher. So you're not stressed about doing well in something that you're majoring in. Um, and you can, you know, focus on your MCATs. Um, and like I said, a lot of my friends did, uh, scribes. You can, I know with coronavirus and the pandemic, it's hard, um, but definitely try to get shadowing experiences, maybe be a scribe at a smaller clinic, um, you know, or be like a medical assistant, anything, anything that kind of shows that you were involved in a healthcare setting and you're familiar with what you're going into um, because you have a long way to really get the nitty gritty details down for medicine. Um, and then once you're in uh, med school, you know, it's, it never hurts to do research. Um, like, especially that's the only time you will have to do uh, basic science research. Once you're in clinical training, you really don't have time unless you take a year off for that or you join an MD PhD program where the PhD years you would be doing basic science research. Um, there's no real advantage I mean, I don't think you have to do an MD, PhD if you want to get into a, a competitive program. You could, if let's say you were aiming for a very competitive field. Um, I think the, more, the most competitive fields are plastic surgery, neurosurgery, and dermatology. Um, and so those, you know, obviously you, you want to have a very well-rounded application. But at the end of the day, your scores really matter the most. I think now with the USMLE changing their formats, um, that's kind of not, hopefully that's not going to be a big, um, you know, deciding factor. But so far, that's the main deciding factor is your USMLE step one score. Um, that's the first filter every program uses to filter applicants. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, so try to get some Get, make sure you have a well-rounded CV, get experience in healthcare related stuff. You know, you could be, um, it doesn't have to be only medicine. It can also be something like a debate team or you give a talk, let like a TED talk or, um, you, you know, some volunteer experience that shows sort of teamwork, leadership, um, working in stressful situations and, you know, working basically with other healthcare professionals. Um, so DOs are, I, I saw a question about DO representation. So DOs are really well represented these days. Um, that's a misunderstanding that um, DOs have a hard, uh, it's hard for them to match. Um, so DOs have an advantage where not only you apply to the DO match, but if you do your USMLEs, you can also apply to the actual NRMP medicine match. So you're, you have more chances of matching in my opinion and um, you can, um, you know, when I did my residency, we had, uh, let's say like maybe 30%, don't, don't quote that number, but 25 to 30%, maybe even 40, not, I would say close to 50, but 
definitely 25 to 30 percent were DOs. And even in fellowship, um, we have DO um, specialty doctors, you know, cardiology. I'm sure you guys heard about the the recent FIGS ad about um, it was very inappropriate. It, it wasn't just a, a slap at, you know, DOs specifically. It was, it was um, you know, it was inappropriate towards women physicians or women healthcare it could have it could have been any tag it could have said rn and it would have been the same thing you know um women physicians uh are kind of ditzy or um clumsy they're reading books upside down and they're reading a book for dummies which is very inappropriate we work really hard to get to where we are um so and that actually opened up a conversation about deal representation and i would say that you know i think Programs do not, um, they are not biased towards MDs or DOs. And they're very, they actually look at your, your CV and your um, overall application. Um, let me see if I can actually look at the chat. And One question that uh, we've gotten is, are there any tips for networking with doctors in your field of interest? Yes, absolutely. So like I was telling you, um, when I, the first step I did is matching into a program where I saw that they had a GI department and they had their own fellowship program because programs that have a fellowship program um, do more research and they are, all, are, you know, more academic and your best chance of matching after residency into a fellowship is at your home program. So that was the first thing I did, but of course that's not always, you can, that's not something you can control. So even if you're not at a program in residency that has their own fellowship program, but you are partners with a community, like your community hospital partners with another academic, take elective time, ask your program director to give you time to go and do a, a rotation. That's, that's what really um, makes or breaks. So I was actually doing interviews yesterday for fellowship and um, we had a couple of internal candidates and the when they work with us, you know, when when I see residents rotating with me, um, uh, even if they're from a different hospital and they really leave an impression, they, they work closely with the fellows, you're presenting on rounds um, and that really kind of, it's kind of like an audition elective and the fellows are like, you know, I really liked working with this resident. I, I, would to I can totally see myself working with them as a fellow and we you know because you have to be approachable friendly you have to learn how to you know be collegial and uh, you know professional I guess when you take consults on the phone that's a big thing to be polite and um, you know when you talk to the hospitalists and you have to be in constant communication about your recommendations and things like that um, another thing is uh, you know research is is important for fellowship that are competitive, uh, typically cardiology and gastroenterology, um, you know, they do look, we look at research. So, um, and it, it sucks that it may be like, there are programs or there are people who do research, like, a, you know, they have a group. And if one person does a study, they put the names of five people in that group, but that's the way it is. Sometimes that's how it is. It's not always fair that, you know, you just did a little bit of the work. But I would say like, if you can have that niche where you find a group of people who are motivated to do research and each of you does something separate, but then at the end you get five papers out of it and all of you have, if you, it doesn't have, you don't have to be first author, but your name is on that publication that, that looks good. Um, so definitely in, get involved in research, identify mentors, not based on what you are interested in, uh, but find mentors who are actually good researchers, who actually um, publish, who actually are, you know, interested in research genuinely. So they're actually taking extra time after their long clinical day to do research. Um, it, it obviously helps if you have research with someone who has a name in that field. So someone who's actually an expert, let's say, you know, for example, for motility, we, uh, we always say Dr. Pandolfino is like the, you know, the guru of motility. And so if you do research with him, that's, that's great, you know, cause he's a, he's a known name in GI. He's known in motility the same way you have people in IBD, 
or advanced endoscopy that are like well-known names. These are the people who write the guidelines. Um, so if you can get research with them, that's that's great. If they're if you just have their name or the chief of the department or the you know the director, um, names do matter. Also, recommendations from those people matter. If you make a connection, um, you know you shadow them for like a couple of weeks and then ask them to put in a good word. Find out if they know anyone in other programs. Um, so uh, you know, so the tip tip is basically get involved early on during intern year. Identify a mentor to do research with who is a good researcher. Not necessarily. Sometimes they could be the chief of GI, but they don't do research. So you know, you, you want to identify someone who um, does research and then you can still shadow that chief or the director in GI so that you can get a letter from them as long as they're, they write good letters and they will write you a strong one. So the letter from a big name also matters. So it's the letter of recommendation, the research that you do, um, because, you know, you're not doing any scores. They're not looking at your, there's no USMLE or MCAT anymore. So now it's all about connections, getting the name out and basically um, identifying uh, good role models and starting research early on. Uh, but, um, one question um, mm -hmm. privately that was asking about like, what is your typical day-to-day -day like? Yes. So typical day-to-day -day life in GI, it, it, it's pretty standard for um, whether you do private practice or academic. Um, uh, typically you would do uh, for private practice um, and academic, you would have a week like Monday through Friday and you would divide it either two days of clinic, two days of endoscopy and a, another half day of clinic with half day administrative time or you can do two and a half days of endoscopy, two and a half days of clinic, no, no procedure, no administrative time. So um, when you are in clinic, you basically see patients all day starting typically eight, 8.30 to like five, 4.30 or five. Uh, any, in any day you can see between, I would say average is 14 to 20 patients, depending on if you're a private academic, they usually give you 30 minute slots. Uh, private practice sometimes will have, uh, 20 minute slot. So they try to squeeze in more uh, with a lunch break in between. So clinic is pretty much, you know, in and out of patient room, documenting your fine, you know, writing your note, seeing the next one or writing your note at the end of the day. And then you have lunch time. When we do procedures, it's same day. It's all day of procedures from the beginning to the end. Um, usually we do upper endoscopies for 30 minute slots. And we do um, sometimes colonoscopies also for 30 minute slots. Um, sometimes we do a double, which is upper and lower at the same time. And that can be about 40, 45 minutes. Um, so pretty much the day is stacked, you know, um, and the endoscopy days go super fast because you're doing your procedure. As soon as you're done with the procedure, you write the procedure note. It's like a templated, we have a program that templates kind of most of it. And then you fill in your details, print it out, go to the recovery. The patient's kind of already awake because anesthesia is pretty fast. Uh, most places use propofol or monitored anesthesia care instead of moderate sedation, which is fentanyl and Versed. So propofol leaves your, your body really fast and you're kind of back to normal within a few minutes. With fentanyl and Versed, which is moderate sedation, you may feel groggy for a couple of hours and people kind of forget what you said. But you go to the recovery, give them the report, go over the findings and tell them that you'll contact them with the biopsy results and make a follow-up, you know, they'll ask them to make a follow-up back to the room. The next patient's already there, hooked up, start the procedure. So super fast. Um, and uh, the admin time is just like a half day. Not all programs have them. I, I don't have any admin time currently, uh, but you kind of use your free time to catch up on your billing because you have to bill for everything you do, your procedures, your clinic notes, for doing pathology letters because you have to send out the results from the clinic blood, blood work or biopsies. Um, and you know, those are, those are time consuming too. Um, so that's a typical outpatient week. When I'm on inpatient, I will only be doing inpatient consults. So because I'm academic, I have, a, I have two fellows on inpatient service at any given, more, at every, any given point. 
So um, I go in in the morning, you know, check up on the charts. The fellows get all the consoles, they round on those patients, and then they come and we do rounds together. Uh, number of people involved in rounds can be variable. So typically, um, and I'm actually going to post about this on Instagram, who's involved when you do rounds. So you have the attending, then you have a senior fellow, and uh, sometimes you have two senior fellows versus one senior and another junior fellow. You will have some residents on the team that are rotating through GI elective, and those residents can be from your hospital or from another hospital. So I have had residents from um, Georgetown come to hospital center or Sometimes residents from hospital center go to, go to Georgetown, and those residents are the ones that are interested in GI. We also have an inpatient nurse practitioner who also sees consults with the fellows, but she's independent, he or she, and they can see uh, patients on their own and bill for them on their own. But the first time, the new consults, they run by the attending, and then they can do their own follow-ups. The fellows' notes have to be co-signed by the attending, so... Um, so we, you know, do table rounds. We talk about all the new consults. We go over the old consults from the previous days. Uh, we uh, make a plan and then we go round, physically go and round and see all the different patients on the wards. We decide who needs the procedure and we then they get posted for the next day in endoscopy. Uh, when you're an inpatient, you do your own procedures. So my typical day would be procedures in the morning, wherever we have open slots, um, and then round, maybe squeeze another procedure in the afternoon and then do afternoon rounds. And that's pretty much it. And on the weekends, I'm, um, I'm actually on call this weekend. <laughs> so I have one fellow who is going to be rounding and seeing the new consoles. And then I will go in, um, round with them, talk about it, see the patients and then make a plan. There was a question asking um, if you could speak about your decision on pursuing academic practice over private practice, kind of what factored into that and major, di major differences. Yes. Um, so um, so I, I kind of did a post about this uh, on Instagram, but I'm going to go into a little more detail because, you know, you can't really talk a lot on those posts. But um, I, you know, when you come out of um, medical school, all you see is academic, right? You're, you're, you're the resident, you're the medicine, you're the med student, um, and then you do residency fellowship and you're still in an academic setting. So I felt like I just, that's when you realize like, oh, I really like the setting. I like working with a team. I like working in a hospital. Um, I like working with residents and medical students, I like that kind of teaching aspect as well. So um, that's kind of what I only, what I knew, even though I have had um, friends and I have shadowed someone in private practice and you see it's a very different, you know, there's a difference in autonomy um, where the, you know, here it's a team decision sometimes. Um, and, um, you know, in private practice, you're, you're on your own, you know, you, it's just you all day by yourself doing clinic, doing procedures. So um, the pace is different um, and you don't get that kind of interaction with the, with the academic, you know, medical students or residents um, or other fellows, obviously. So um, I really like that aspect. That was like my main factor. Um, I would also say that uh, within Washington, DC, um, you know, I, I wanted to, the location was another factor that, um, I wanted to do, I wanted to practice in the city um, because my husband was there. And so I, uh, I thought that was like a better fit for me. But talking about a more generalized uh, private practice versus academic, there's a lot of different factors and no two private practices and no two academic practices are the same. So I'm actually not at the, I'm part of Georgetown, but I'm not at Georgetown for clinical work. I'm at hospital center which is kind of like the community affiliate of the university hospital. So our private, our, our practice model is slightly different from how it would be at another academic university. So, you know, we have our own clinic. So I, I, some days I do procedures by myself. I don't always have a fellow in the room with me, but other places you will always have a fellow. 
Um, you'll always have a fellow in clinic. You'll always have a fellow in endoscopy. So you're kind of like more hands-off. Um, here I'm a bit of both. So I still get that private practice kind of feel where I'm doing procedures all day. I'm doing clinic by myself. I have my own patient panel. But then I also have fellows clinic where I um, mentor. We rotate doing fellows clinic. And then I also have fellows and procedures with me, so I get to teach them. Um, yeah, those days can be slightly slower, but you know, you're teaching and that's how you became a, a, an attending. So that's part of the process. Um, so I would say, you know, financially also there's differences in how you're reimbursed private practice. You basically, um, you have overhead charges. You have to pay for your lease or your, uh, you know, your office space, your, your, all your staff, you have to, factor that um, typically academic or community or even hospital employed you can still be private practice but hospital employed uh, where you're not with an academic institute so there's like different models um, but you know your salary typically and you have something called rvus where you get bonuses if you hit a certain um, target uh, for the variety of every procedure or clinic has different um, numbers or points attached to it, I would say, to make it more simplified. It's a little more complex than that. Um, and, you know, so it's it's just a difference in, um, I would say, lifestyle, work-life balance, um, financial reimbursement. Um, so you really have to look into the nitty-gritty details of that practice. But big umbrella, it's more like private practice. You are your your own boss, basically, you're doing everything, you have to account for overhead charges, but you're doing your procedures, you have no one, you know, shadowing you or what, or you're not training anyone. Academic, you have the opportunity for research, you have opportunity for teaching, it's up to you how much time you want to dedicate to that, no one's forcing, I'm not doing research, I'm not forced to do research, but it's it's good to kind of maybe come up with a QI project here and there, because quality improvement's always good. Um, and there's also private practice people who do QI. So it's it's not black and white, I would say, um, but the big factors are kind of looking at the work-life balance of that practice and then seeing if that's a good fit for you. Thank you. Um, so there's another question. You mentioned that you do like endoscopies and some other procedures. So someone asked how long are the usual procedures? And then we had another private question asking if you perform any kind of surgical procedures. Um, so the procedures are typically, uh, like I said, uh, upper endoscopies can take, we, we get 30 minute slots, but that's accounting for room turnover. The procedure itself is only five to 10 minutes. Um, so the upper endoscopy, it's about a thin scope size of my pinky finger. It has a light and a camera. It's a flexible tube. We go through, we sit, put a bite block in your mouth, sedate you, um, and then we go in with the scope take a look at your esophagus, food pipe, your stomach, and the first part of your small bowel, um, and, you know, see if there's any erosions, any ulcers, take biopsies. Sometimes you can do something specialized during endoscopy if needed, like some people. Sometimes we do Botox injections for achalasia. We do dilations if there's a narrowing or a stricture. I do pH placement where, you know, so that can add an extra, like, two, three minutes, but typically endoscopies are under 10 minutes. A colonoscopy is um, slightly longer. It's a thicker tube about the size of my index finger. It has a light and a camera, also flexible. Uh, and we go in through your, um, your rectum and we go all the way to the end of your colon. Um, and the landmark for that is when you once you see the ileocecal valve, it's a dead end and you see the appendiceal orifice, which is an impression of the appendix. Um, and then on withdrawal, that's when you kind of you know, the first thing is just getting to the end. You're not looking at anything. On your withdrawal is when you evaluate and inspect the colon for any polyps, any um, irregular, you know, any inflammation like colitis. You can, we can take biopsies. If we see any polyps, we remove them by either a jumbo forceps um, or a snare, which is like a lasso, like a metal lasso that you can cut a snare off the polyp. Um, and then during the colonoscopy as well, you can do something more specialized, such as hemorrhoid banding um, for internal hemorrhoids. We don't do anything surgical per se. Um, we do uh, we do 
peg placement, which is percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube placement, which is the G tube. We can do that through endoscopy, but it's not, I mean, surgeons can do it too, but they also do it through endoscopy sometimes, or they can do an open peg. So that's, I guess, kind of semi-surgical, but anything we do is through endoscopy. We do not do surgery where we make an incision over bare skin. We do it through the scope. So we will make an incision in the stomach to put the feeding tube, but it's while we're looking with a scope inside the stomach. Um, and then hemorrhoid banding, for example, is something that is cross crosses over with surgery. Um, so even the colorectal surgeons can do hemorrhoid banding. Um, you can do it in office or you can do it with endoscopy. And a lot of surgeons are trained in colonoscopy and endoscopy. So I work close as a gastroenterologist. I work very closely with bariatric surgery that do weight loss surgery um, and hernia repairs and you know thoracic surgery and colorectal surgery because those three surgeons are in the same organs as us. And so we work very closely with them. So I may have a patient who um, has uh, a Rue and Y gastric bypass. And so if they're bleeding, I'll do their endoscopy, but a bariatric surgeon or a thoracic surgeon also does endoscopy. And they can also take a look and look at what's going on, especially if they did their surgery. Uh, but a lot of times they're not comfortable or, you know, they are, they're busy. So they'll send them to us, be like, hey, can you see if there's an ulcer? What's, why are they bleeding? Um, same thing with, you know, someone who has achalasia or narrowing. Um, you know, we will be the ones diagnosing it through manometry or endoscopy. And then the surgeons, the thoracic surgeons will do the surgery where they will do a myotomy. Um, there's something called, there's something new called POEM, per oral endoscopic myotomy. So actually you're doing myotomy through endoscopy. So it's kind of like um, a less a minimally invasive myotomy. And that's actually done by both GI and surgery. So, but to keep things simple, anything that involves endoscopy is done by us. Um, the surgeons can also do endoscopy, but they mainly do the surgery, which is actually making an incision from the outside towards inside. We do everything from the inside out, if that makes sense. So we had another question that was, um, what are some of your most interesting cases? So my favorite case, I mean, I love doing colonoscopies a lot. Um, you know, upper endoscopies can be, um, I mean, they're short, but, you know, colonoscopies can be really rewarding when you find like a big polyp and you remove them. One of my favorite procedures is actually hemorrhoid banding. Um, and by talking about specific cases, I think the most, the, the, the most interesting cases that we see are foreign body ingestions. So we get a lot of, that's considered an emergency. So if I'm on call and somebody swallowed something, we need to do an endoscopy within like six, six to maybe 12 hours at most. Um, actually six hours is ideal because, you know, uh, so suppose you had a lot of patients who have mental health issues or, um, you know, a lot of uh, prisoners, um, sometimes they'll swallow things like they'll swallow a nail or they'll swallow a battery or they'll swallow um, lots of different poopery of things that are swallowed. Um, uh, they'll swallow a coin or something. And so um, if it's something like a battery, it has to be removed ASAP because it can corrode through your walls because it's alkaline and it's corrosive something like a coin or um, any other metal piece, you know, it, it, it won't pass through your, it may get embedded in the wall. So basically that's the, I think that those are the most interesting in my opinion. And I, I try to keep posting a few interesting things, um, um, you know, as a story, the, 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 guess what this op, guess what this foreign object is. So you'll see the x-ray and you'll see a little shadow and then you have to guess what it is. And, it, you know, so I, I've had a variety of, some people swallow like toys, um, you know, so those are always the most interesting one to see what you'll find. Um, so those are considered an emergency. So we usually go in and retrieve them. We have different tools for retrieving objects from the stomach. Um, we have something called a rat tooth, which is like a two prong thing. We have a three prong device where we can kind of grab it, like, you know, how you have those 
machines at like an arcade where you grab a toy. Same, same concept. You're going in with the endoscopy and you take out this little forceps and you try to grab that object. We use something called an over tube, which is so it doesn't, you know, cut or damage your vocal cords as we're pulling it out. So there's a tube between your food pipe and the mouth. Um, most of these patients are intubated for airway protection so that the foreign object or the secretion doesn't cause aspiration or pneumonia. Um, the other thing is um, food impaction. So a lot of times people may be eating steak or something that's not, they didn't chew it well, or they have, they actually have a motility problem or, you know, problems with difficulty swallowing, or they have something called EOE or eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a narrow esophagus. And so um, that they can get food stuck there. And that's also something uh, that we need to attend emergently because what happens is they can't swallow their own saliva so they can actually regurgitate saliva and it can they can aspirate get pneumonia um, and or they can't breathe because there's like a buildup of fluid so uh, if they're not able to swallow their saliva they're constantly spitting up or having secretions we go in and we try to break down the food impaction or again retrieve it with those tools that I was mentioning um, so I, I always think those are you know um, kind of time, time sensitive, kind of exciting. Um, and then another thing is bleeding as well. Um, you know, if someone has esophageal varices, which are these enlarged veins in your, in your esophagus, usually with chronic liver disease or cirrhosis, um, which is like end-stage liver failure. So you, we can do banding for those enlarged veins so that patients don't, sometimes you'll throw up blood because of that, you know, and so that's something that we also take care of. So I, I find like the more acute cases to be more interesting. Thank you. That's really cool. Um, someone asked, and I think this is a good question, what are the most fulfilling aspects of your specialty and what are the most challenging aspects? Um, so <clears throat> I would say the most fulfilling aspect is the the actually visualizing the lesion and treating it. I think that's the most gratifying experience. And that's what we get consulted on because, you know, we don't know what we're actually visually going inside with a scope and a camera and looking at the lining of the food pipe, the stomach, the colon, and figuring out what what's the injury and what's bleeding, what's going on. And we can actually fix it. With, we have tools while we're looking at it to fix it. It's not just a diagnostic study, it's also therapeutic. So I find that the most gratifying that it's like a visual fixing and visual gratification. You know, you see a bleeding vessel and you, you see an ulcer that's bleeding, you can treat it right then and there. And, and basically it, it, you know, you are kind of helping uh, the patient, um, you know, cause they could bleed out and potentially um, have problems. They could, you know, potentially die. And so you're actually helping them, um, you know, you're fixing their problem without having to, dip, you know, assume that you're fixing it by medication or trying different strategies. So it, it, so that's the procedural part is immediate gratification. Um, I think the more challenging part is, of course, the, the, the gray areas that still exist, even though um, GI is pretty black and white, there are still some gray areas, not as much as some other fields, but for example, we get patients who have chronic abdominal pain or they have severe IBS that we cannot fix or we cannot manage. You can't fix it, but you can only manage it. So um, those are always complicated because patients have had pain for so long and they they come in and you know um, they want an instant relief. And unfortunately, you have to work very closely with the patient over a couple of weeks, maybe months, and eventually they will get relief. Um, we have a lot of new medications. We have a lot of um, therapies. It's not just medic medical therapy or GI. It's a multidisciplinary approach by sending them, give, putting them on a specific diet to avoid the triggers that cause IBS, putting, working with a psychologist to help with certain uh, like diaphragmatic breathing or certain maneuvers to help you know, de-stress their gut. So there's a very strong gut-brain connection 
Um, so the way you're feeling will affect your GI tract. The, the GI tract is very smart. It has its own enteric nervous system. Um, and so that's very hypervigilant. So that's why, you know, you may have heard the term, oh, I have butterflies in my stomach when I'm nervous, or I need, I have to go to the bathroom. I, I am, I'm too nervous, like, you know, and you have diarrhea. So your emotions are very much connected with how your GI system functions. And so that's why it's not just, um, I mean, there's the acuity part where we're seeing and fixing, but then there's this long-term illness that, you know, is a little more challenging, but it is something that requires time and patience and patient time and patience with a CE and patients with TS have to understand that they've had illness for so long that it's going to take time, but we're gonna work with them together and also involve some other specialists and, and get them relief. Yeah, someone said that they learned in their physiology class that the gut is like a mini brain. So that's really interesting that you said that. Mm -hmm. So then we're going to, this is going to be our last question for today. Someone asked, how often do you have to take on the role of a dietitian, and how do you help patients stick to a specific diet plan? Um, yes. So diet is very important for some of our diseases. So I specialize in, uh, or I have a focus in esophagus. So I see a lot of patients with chronic reflux that's not responding to medications. I get second and third opinions. Um, so diet and lifestyle is the first step for a lot of GI diseases, whether it's uh, acid reflux, whether it's IBS, celiac, obviously, it's the first step is gluten-free diet. Um, and even with something like EOE or eosinophilic esophagitis, sometimes you have to do a six food elimination diet. So most of the times we have, we have good handouts that are, that talk about the foods to avoid. So I usually tell patients to follow elimination diets where you eliminate everything at once for a couple of weeks, and then you start in reintroducing foods one at a time within only one food within 24 hours, because that's when the effects are immediate. So you'll know right away if you're having symptoms from that food and you keep a food diary. Sometimes if patients have um, a lot of other medical problems, like they're diabetic or they have some, some other allergy, food allergies, it's, a more, it's more complicated for them to just follow a handout. So then I would send them to a dietitian. I don't always send patients to a dietitian, but because um, I think they are savvy enough to follow the handout and look through and, you know, the dietitian won't know what you're sensitive to. Only you will know that. So you have to do trial and error and you know your body the best and you can figure out, okay, you know, this food is causing me bloating. I probably need to stay away from this. And a lot of times those food sensitivities, I, they're not allergies, they're sensitivities. They're temporary, they're not permanent. It could be because of something going on in your life, you're stressed or your environment is different. Um, your microbiome is different. Like, you know, so those things can change over time. Like you could become tolerant of those foods as time goes on. Um, so I would say like, you know, if I think that a patient is having, is struggling, then I would, I don't refer them on the first go. I usually refer them as a follow-up. If I see that they're not able to follow it, they need some more help handholding, maybe a more structured plan, then I would send them to a dietitian. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that's it. Um, someone said EOE is a mouthful. <laughs> so. And people, I, I think you can see the chat there saying it's an amazing, informative session. And it really was. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're most welcome. You know, I know it's, it's a lot. I mean, I basically summarized what 12, 13, I mean, I don't know, 15 years of my life in an hour. Um, it's a long journey, but, you know, um, that's why it's important to kind of, we can focus. If, if you have more questions, I'm happy to focus on like one specific aspect of it. Of course. And then do you want to um, tell them your Instagram handle if they want to go ahead and follow you? Yes, I'm trying to be more active on it. So <laughs> um, my Instagram handle is gastro.doc.nabi. Uh, Nabi. <laughs> we'll put that in the chat just so they can yeah. follow you too. Yeah, feel free to reach out um, with any other questions that you guys have. Uh, you know, uh, the la uh, the only 
closing remark I will give is a piece of advice is don't give up. If you're really passionate about um, something, you should definitely pursue it and um, follow your gut. <laughs> That was, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you guys, you so everyone, much. for being here. Um, thank you, Dr. Nabi, for um, giving us your time, especially when you're on call. Um, we really appreciate it. And I think everyone learned a lot here. We hope you don't have to go take out any foreign objects. <laughs> yeah, let's cross our fingers. So far, the days have been good, guys. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day.